This evening, our topic is going to be on sacrifice. This is something that has been going on in my mind as I've prepared for lessons up in Mount Vernon, and we've been studying in Hebrews about those things which are better, that Christ is better than the angels, that he is a better high priest, that he offers a better covenant. Today I spoke about the fact that he is a better sacrifice. Now, Froggy there, who has the cold and isn't speaking tonight, called me up yesterday or maybe, maybe Friday and asked if I'd bring a lesson tonight. And I've added to what I taught this afternoon. It's a little bit more in depth. Um, but hopefully it'll provide some in, insight about not only our sacrifice, but uh, Christ's sacrifice and, and the way that was sacrifices were done under the old law. Walter Joseph Marm, Jr. He received the Congressional Medal of Honor. His rank and organization is first lieutenant. At the time, he was the second lieutenant. U.S. Army, Company A, 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Division, Air Mobile. The place and date, the vicinity of La Drang Valley, Republic of Vietnam, 14 November, 1965. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of life above and beyond the call of duty, as a platoon leader in the 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile, 1st Lieutenant Marm demonstrated indomitable courage during a combat operation. His company was moving through the valley to relieve a friendly unit surrounded by an enemy force of estimated regimental size. 1st Lieutenant Marm led his platoon through withering fire until they were finally forced to take cover. Realizing that his platoon could not hold very long, and seeing four enemy soldiers moving into his position, he moved quickly under heavy fire and annihilated all four. Then, seeing that his platoon receiving intense fire from a concealed machine gun, he deliberately exposed himself to draw its fire. Thus locating its position, he attempted to destroy it with an anti-tank weapon. Although he inflicted casualties, the weapon did not silence the enemy fire. Quickly disregarding the intense fire directed on him and his platoon, he charged 30 meters across open ground. He hurled grenades into the enemy position, killing some of the eight insurgents manning it. Although severely wounded, when his grenades were expended, armed with only a rifle, he continued the momentum of his assault on the position and killed the remainder of the enemy. First Lieutenant Marm's selfless actions reduced the fire on his platoon broke the enemy assault, and rallied his unit to continue toward the accomplishment of his mission. First Lieutenant Marm's gallantry on the battlefield and his extraordinary intrepidity at the risk of his life are in highest traditions in the U.S. Army and reflect great credit upon himself and the armed forces of his country. This First Lieutenant Marm knew about sacrifice and he sacrificed his life for those others that were with him he considered the cost he looked it out and he saw what was before him he knew what the likely outcome was going to be and he worked to save others as a soldier first lieutenant marm committed himself to his duty he put aside his own suffering, he put aside his own self-concern, and he fulfilled the obligations to his charge, to his position. It is possible, if he had made it home alive, that he would have been unappreciated. There are many fine men and women who put their lives on the line every day. This gentleman did so in Vietnam. Many came home unappreciated, treated poorly, hated. Sadly, that's a reality for a great number of folks 
whose desire is not of self, but to serve, to sacrifice, knowing again what is before them. But, unfortunately, unlike Lieutenant Marm, First Lieutenant Marm, some of those folks will always go, at least unknown, if not unappreciated, or yeah, unappreciated. I want to start out tonight as we talk about sacrifice, <clears throat> and I was thinking about sacrifice, what exactly is the difference between an offering and a sacrifice? And I looked about, and I think I, I've come upon a, a definition that is appropriate. It's by a gentleman, R. Milligan. He's the president of the College of Bible and Kentucky University. I don't know anything about that college, uh, but I will think his definition appears to be spot on. It says, the difference between an offering and a sacrifice is simply this. The latter is a species of the former. They are, are all sacrifices or offerings, but all offerings are not sacrifices. A sacrifice always implies of necessity a real change or destruction of the thing it's offered. But everything presented to God, whether changed or unchanged, was called an offering or an oblation when we look at Scripture. Now, from his definition, sacrifice implies two things. This, this real change or a destruction of what is offered. In regard to the Mosaic sacrifice, we see the physical things sacrificed and indeed they're destroyed. In regard to Christ's sacrifice, we see his physical body offered up and indeed it is destroyed. And in regard to the Christian sacrifice, which we will look at, I will suggest there is a deep change, and indeed there is also a destruction or a death. Let's start out tonight, and we will look at the law of Moses first. Now, sacrifice is under the law of Moses. Of course, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, and they're headed towards Mount Sinai, and of course the law is handed down, in the law and all of that, are the uh, wisdom given by the Holy Spirit for a holy ab and Bezalel to build the tabernacle. And at the tabernacle, of course, uh, there would be offerings uh, presented for the people. Now, the tabernacle overall is probably oh, about a third the size of a football field. And that would include the, the large, essentially, curtain that is around the tabernacle itself. When you come down to the tabernacle, it's divided into two portions. You have uh, in that the outer veil, which gets you into the first portion, which is the holy place. Now, out in that courtyard, before you go into the holy place, I should say that there is a bronze altar and there is a bronze laver or a wash, wash area. But once you go into the tabernacle, into that holy place, you'll see a table of showbread, you'll see uh, the candle, and you will see an altar of incense. Furthermore, you would go into that Holy of Holies, but the Holy of Holies, that secondary place within the tabernacle, only the high priest could enter into that area. That is where the Ark of the Covenant would be. That is uh, where, uh, the, uh, where uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant is, and that is where the, essentially the presence of, of God would be. Now, the high priest each year would go in and he would offer the blood of bulls, the blood of goats, again for his sins and also for the sin of the people. I'd like to read in Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 1 through 4. And we want to talk a little bit about the law and the sacrificial system. Here in Hebrews 10, we begin now in verse 1. <clears throat> for the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifice, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect, or those, the worshipers. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscious of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away 
sins. So the, the law is, is but an image of something greater. The law is an image, uh, it's a shadow, if you would, and it was not perfect. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7, For if that the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Sadly, what was often offered under the old law to God in that tabernacle, and then ultimately as well in the temple, was not pleasing to God. And the uh, prophet Malachi, chapter 1, verses 10 through 14, would discuss that. He would discuss how uh, the, the sacrifices brought by the people ultimately were loathsome to them. They didn't want to be involved in the, the giving of sacrifices. Now, remember, a sacrifice for them was a, a substitution. It was something that was losing its life, an animal in these cases, animals living their, losing their life in place of those people. But uh, they, didn't, they didn't appreciate it at that time when Malachi is talking. In fact, a great deal of their history, they did not appreciate the sacrifices that were going on. And so what would they would do? They would give those things which God did not ask. They would give the blind animal. They would give the crippled animal. They would give uh, the spotted or, spot or the unclean animal. They wouldn't give what, what God had desired. So uh, they weren't committed. They weren't committed in their sacrifice. They themselves were not sacrificing, though the animal, of course, was completely sacrificed. So that's a situation under the law of Moses. But what about that under the law of Christ? Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14, if you would. Now looking at verse 11, But Christ being come, and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building or of this creation, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place. Now the holy place here we speak of is heaven. Up, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. The sacrifice <clears throat> mentioned here in verse 11 is in that more perfect tabernacle that is within heaven. That is the reality, not the image, not the shadow which the tabernacle here upon earth was. It is not of this creation. It is not of the hands of man. And verse 12 it speaks of that holy place. And again, simply just a, a parallel uh, uh, for heaven where the presence of God truly is, where God himself truly is. Hebrews 9, verse 23, is it was therefore necessary, now they're going through at this point, and in the context, they're talking about the physical things offered. Is it was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. And what is the better sacrifice we're talking about? The better sacrifice we're talking about is that which was given by Christ, his body, his blood, that sacrifice. Heavenly sacrifice demands something so much more than what is here upon this earth. Now in verses 12 and 14 that we read, uh, Jesus, it is mentioned that his own blood was offered, it, that, that which is pure, that which was holy. Uh, it certainly wasn't the spotted or the defiled or the blind, those things, the physical. Uh, it was pure and holy blood of, yes, one who was in flesh, but one who was, who was deity, one who was without sin, which had never uh, in our history been, nor will it be again, upon this earth. Jesus obtained, in offering his blood, according to verse 12, he obtained eternal redemption for us. He bought us back from our sins, bought us back from the condemnation, bought us back from the captivity which was upon us. And in verse 14, he caused us to act in a fruitful manner. And we'll come back to that in a few moments. But I want to read a few more passages, beginning now Hebrews 9, verses 25 through 28. Nor yet that he should offer himself often. This, of course, speaking of Christ, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others, the others, of course, being animals. Uh, for then must he have... 
For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, judgment. So Christ once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. In this passage, there's something important to look at, and that is when he returns, those who he comes to where he do not reference, or it is not a contemplation or an issue regarding sin, would be those that look to him. That is the faithful. Some say, well, he's going to return without uh, any concept of sin or discussion of sin to anybody. But, oh, yes, indeed, he will. For the angels will come in flaming fire, according uh, to Second Thessalonians. There will be a judgment. Well, it will be to those that do not look to him. But here we speak of, of the faithful. Let's continue. Hebrews 10, 9 and 10. Then said he, Lo, I come to do the will, thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, which is the first covenant, that he may establish the second. That is a covenant in Christ which we live under today. Verse 10, By the which we are sanctified, that is set apart, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Much is the same we see in Jude. Once for all, a sacrifice needed no longer, save that one time. Continuing now, verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected, or completed, forever them that are set apart. So what is he talking about? Those that look to him. From all the way back there in verse 28. Those that are, uh, that are sanctified from verse 10. These are the ones that are set apart. These are the ones that he's completed forever. Continuing verses 17 and 18. And their sins and iniquities I remember, will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So in these passages, we see a one-time offering of Christ's blood. And it is something which perfects or completes those who have set themselves apart in Christ. So there is no longer any other offering needed. His sacrifice put away, again, sin for those that look toward him. So here's a summary of what we've got, just at least in regard to sacrifice, and specifically Christ's sacrifice. We know that his sacrifice was presented in heaven for others, in that more perfect tabernacle, not upon this earth. We know that his holy blood was needed only once, Christ committing himself to God's charge. And the sins of those who set themselves apart in Christ are never remembered again. But when you think about the sacrifice of Christ, again, not everyone appreciated it. In fact, some outright hated it. Let's talk about Christian sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I was looking at this and I thought there are so many different lessons that could be built upon this, but we'll keep it really, really brief. I beseech you therefore, brethren, Paul speaking to the Romans, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, in Romans 12 here, we see many things that we've already mentioned or we've briefly touched on. God desires that our lives be a holy sacrifice to him. And our sacrifice is just our charge. It's our reasonable service. It's our duty. Our, our sacrifice is a fulfillment of the charge which God has given us to live a life of good works following in, in his paths, to follow his commandments, to do that which is holy and just. As Christians, we need to determine if we are indeed sacrificing. Has there been some big change that we've made since we've become Christians? Is our life transformed uh, as we would have in Romans 12? Are we transformed and fulfilling our charge? Are we proving the will of our Heavenly Father? You know, early in this lesson, we read a definition of a sacrifice. This is a real change 
or death of what is offered. I want to consider that for a few moments in regard to this Christian sacrifice. What change exactly is shown in a living sacrifice? Well, we can go back to our Hebrews text to see this. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. We've just spoken about how in Christ there is no more remembrance of this sin. Verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That is, to go before God without shame. Not hiding as Adam and Eve did, knowing they were in sin, but standing before God, knowing we have been washed by the pure and holy blood of Christ. He says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. With the earthly tabernacle, he had to go through the veil to get to the holy of holies. We simply go through this flesh to God. And Christ has overcome death. We will rise again new. And Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians 15. There is a resurrection coming of all, the living and the dead, the good and the evil, but the good shall rise together and meet our Lord in the clouds. He continues now in verse 21. It says, And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We have this boldness, this boldness to enter into heaven to go before God. And in doing so, we do it with full assurance because we trust in our Savior. We believe in our Savior. But there's something more. And it ties it here in regard to our conscience. It ties it back to 9 and 14, which I said I would revisit. And there at the latter part of 9 14, speaking of the blood of Christ and speaking that it purges our conscience from dead works, that is those things where we were in sin, the bad fruit, those things that which were not pleasing to God. It cleanses us from those things. Why? From dead works to serve the living God. That's action. That's action, and that's ultimately repentance, going from those evil works to those things which are good. So when you come back to our text here in verse 22, and he says, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Of course, when the, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he would sprinkle the blood of the goats and the blood of the bulls upon those things to, to purge the people himself of sin, to cleanse those things that were of the, uh, of the tabernacle, the, though they were but a mere shadow. So... We are cleansed by the blood of Christ, by the splinking of that, blood, of that blood. But he adds something at the end of this verse. He says, and our bodies washed with pure water. So we have this repentance from our dead works. But then we also have this washing, which is baptism, which corresponds to Mark 16 and 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's essentially what we have in verse 22. It's also the same which we see in Acts 2 and 38, to repent and be baptized. Why? For the forgiveness of our sins. And it also corresponds to how one gets into Christ. There are two passages in regard to this. One is in Romans 6, 3, and actually we'll be returning to that momentarily, but I want to look at this. Romans 6, 3, this passage tells us, Know ye not, though so many of us were baptized into Jesus, Christ were baptized into his death and then also Galatians 3:27 and in Galatians 3:27 we see the same uh, same thing that is getting into Christ that passage tells us the following for as many of you as been baptized into Christ have put on Christ so what change is seen in this living Christian sacrifice? There's a change to these living and good works. There's a change uh, from those evil things. There is a repentance, and that change matches the very definition of what we talked about, a sacrifice. And there is this washing of water that puts us into Christ. To look back now at Hebrews 10 again, and we'll read verses 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that has promised that profession. Jesus is indeed the Son of God. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, 
as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the, the, the more as you see the day approaching. Now, in this passage, the Christian change is seen in a number of ways. We strongly hold our trust in him. We believe in him. Our faith is strong in him. We encourage one another to love. And we provoke, I like that term and I kind of look that up, and it means to incite or to irritate to good works. Uh, it's like, it's something that's continued pushing you, it's like, I got this itch and it's itches telling me do something. Move forward to good works, inciting one another to good works. And we are to assemble together. These are changes that come about because of Christ, because of his sacrifice, and because of our life sacrifice as Christians. But what? What if we continually sin? What if we do not change? Hebrews chapter 10 again, verses 26 and 27. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But wasn't Christ's sacrifice? Wasn't that for all? For all that look for him, one sacrifice and done. But if we take our eyes off Christ, if we turn from him, if we willfully continue in the things of this world where there is indeed no change, there is no sacrifice. Verse 27, what is there? A certain fearful looking for a judgment and fire, and indig fire indignation which shall devour the adversaries. In verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If we continue sinning, Knowing that Christ sacrificed himself for us. Knowing what he went through. Punishment awaits us. Sacrifice demands a change. And as we look at our lives, we have to say, have we changed? Because if we have not changed, if we've hung on to those things that we like, that are of the world, you have not sacrificed. You are not sacrificing. And your soul is in danger. So, in this portion, talking about sacrifice, we've talked about change in a Christian life. But I want to talk about the death aspect of the definition. Galatians 2 and 20 was spoken of. How we ourselves die to ourselves, but we live in Christ. That is a sacrifice that has brought or taken away the worldly things and brought us into those things which are good and holy. But the final passage we look at tonight in regard to this, in regard to a Christian sacrifice, is in Romans chapter 6, in regard to the death of the Christian. So Romans chapter 6, we read here verses 1 through 8. Romans 6, 1 through 8. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. We have died to sins, brothers and sisters. We have given that up. We have sacrificed ourselves, putting away the old man and becoming the new. Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ? We're baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Again, that's stepping away from those dead works of the flesh, those dead works that were purged by the blood of Christ. Now we walk anew. But if we're not walking anew, we have not sacrificed, we have not changed. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. In these few verses, we see that we are dead to sin if we have truly sacrificed. That we walk in newness of life. That we do not serve sin. That we are freed from from sin if we are truly dead if we are truly a sacrifice and if we are truly a Christian sacrifice then we shall live with Christ and in that though it may be unappreciated upon this earth it will be appreciated by our Heavenly Father 
and great reward will, array, will await each and every one of us. So this is a look at sacrifice tonight. We'll look at the fact that uh, a sacrifice is not something that is maybe considered lightly, but it is certainly 100% defined by what Christ did and should be defined by the Christian life. If you're one that wants to be part of that life, then Mark, you can come forward and uh, talk to Mark or talk to any actually other men about making that change into and being added to the church. We'll help you with that. And if you're one of my brothers and sisters and you're looking at your life saying, you know what? Maybe I'm not that living sacrifice. What did we see in the behaviors that we were told to do? To encourage one another. To help one another. To assemble one another. To provoke one another to good works. That's what we'll do. We'll help you along the way. We want to go down that same road, that same path. We want to live eternally with our Heavenly Father. The invitations stand for you now. If you're subject to them, please do come forward while we'll stand and we'll sing.